Hello, I'm Dr. Gloria Horsley, and I'm her daughter, Dr. Heidi Horsley. Heidi and I want to welcome you to Open to Hope Conversations, the podcast. We believe that the greatest gift you can give yourself after a loss is hope, using this moment to connect with others who have not only survived, but thrived. So let's get started. Welcome to the Open to Hope show. I'm your host, Dr. Gloria Horsley, with my daughter and co-host. Dr. Heidi Horsley. Well, Heidi, we've got a really important show today because I know there are so many people that listen to this and watch and are wondering, you know, where's God in all this and what's going on and how are people of faith, what do they do with their suffering and with their loss? And we have a wonderful couple on that are going to give you some great thoughts and ideas about the struggle and of suffering and grief and hope. So Heidi, would you like to introduce them? Sure, I'd love to. And like you said, Mom, we're going to be talking about a struggle with suffering, grief, and hope today. And we are with a very dynamic power couple who are married. Um, so Elizabeth Brady teaches at Penn State, and she is a writer for Open to Hope and for Modern Loss. She was on the advisory board for the PBS documentary called Speaking Grief. And she participated on a panel at the Compassionate Friends National Conference. And next to her is her husband, Dr. Kristen Brady. He is a professor of Jewish studies and the uh, integral dean of the Lewis Honors College at the University of Kentucky. He is also a priest in the Episcopal Church. I find that a fascinating combination, I have to say. <laughs> and he is the author of an amazing book called Beautiful and Terrible Things, A Christian Struggle with Suffering, Grief, and Hope. Welcome to the show, Elizabeth and Christian. Thank you. It's so great to have you guys on the show today. And, and we are so sorry about the loss of your son, Mac. 2012, he died suddenly of a, of a blood infection and reading about that, I mean, such a quick thing. Tell us about that struggle of faith. In terms of the faith aspect, um, I, for me, um, I, I know for many, many people uh, of, of faith, with Christian, Jewish, Muslims, um, uh, don't necessarily think about these sorts of tragedies until they happen in their lives. And so it can then lead to a crisis of faith. I, because this was my academic background training, that wasn't the case for me in the sense that I had already, even I remember as, as a relatively young uh, teen, um, hearing about uh, atrocities around the world and young children dying and realizing just that these sorts of horrors and cancer and all sorts of things are a part of this world. And so I'd already spent a lot, a lot of time in my life reflecting on how to reconcile that with my faith in God um, and a loving God. So it, it wasn't so much for, for me, it, it didn't start with a crisis of faith um it just was just the the grief just the the overwhelming loss in my head when the chaplain came into the misnamed quiet room and told us that mac had died on the helicopter it was a life flight um the first words that came into my mind were from a psalm that jesus uttered on on the cross my god my god why have you forsaken me and um that is a cry of lament. It is not a cry of lack of faith. It's just of despair. Mm -hmm. and so that's that's where I was. Not a lack of faith, but he was gone. Mac was gone, and we knew he wasn't coming back. I've thought about this a lot because, of course, it's not a linear process, right? But one of the habits I developed um, when I lived in West Africa, I lived, um, I lived in the bush in West Africa for a year after I graduated from college. Uh, I was there as what they call a short-term missionary helping run a guest house in, um, in uh, Burkina Faso. Of course, it was a hugely transformative year for me because I'm a suburban kid from Washington, D.C. I had no, I was not equipped to live in the bush. And one of the habits that I developed there was journaling. I was actually required at first uh, to keep a journal, um, but then it became a habit that uh, now, almost 30 years later, I still journal every morning. 
And so after, uh, it's just a part of who I am, almost like exercise or something like that. It, it's right, it becomes a part of your uh, daily being, right? Mm -hmm. And so I distinctly remember after Mac died, um, coming to this place where I write every morning, right? And coming back to this place after maybe two days after he died and sensing so clearly that he was dead, but present, right? And that this is where I could come to keep the connection with him. And so that was, that's something that I, um, uh, was a great comfort to me. Yeah, you, I think you call that sacred space. Is that it is it? my sacred space or my sacred nest, whichever you <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and Elizabeth, um, for, but yeah. for you, your journaling, your, mm -hmm. your journaling is has always been, or at least for much of the time I've known you, a conversation mm -hmm. with God, right? And so now the conversation is with God and Mac. Yeah, and I and I distinctly remember too coming and sitting here and saying, you know, Lord, I am banging on your door because I know this is where I find Him, you know, and. Um, and so I, um, I, you know, it expands and contracts and the things that I read uh, all change all the time. But I absolutely think that that, um, uh, I've thought a lot about that because it was a habit I long developed before Mac died, but it was a court, of course, a place that came back to, to strengthen me too, so. So um, I wanted to ask you, um, now you, uh, Elizabeth, you went to groups, right? You, yeah, I. There's a local group here, um, a small group that was started in particular for um, to focus on loss for children. It was actually established um, to help children. So because we don't have a, we're in a small college town, so we don't have a compassionate friends group. So it was started, but it also has support groups for parents and um, other siblings and things. And so I did, I started going and I would go off and on depending on my schedule, you know, as allowed, uh, but it really did um, that and um, the online readings really did uh, help me to begin to articulate this new time in our lives, right? And that helped me. And in practical ways too. Yeah. How about you, Mac? Did you do group things at all? Or and do you think that men and women have a different take? What's your thought? Well, I uh, start with the latter first, men versus women. I, I don't, um, I mean, everybody's different and unique for sure. It is interesting. I do think fathers and mothers can have slightly different engagements uh, with their grief. Um, Mac was just uh, two weeks short of his ninth birthday. And we were <clears throat> really just kind of coming into the stage in life where I was engaging much more deeply with Mac over the last couple of years of his life. Prior to that, it was all mom all the time. You know, I would try and be there as much as I can, but there is there is that deep connection. And, um, and I've spent a lot of time um, grieving over the fact that because of my travel and things like that, there's just, you know, I... I think sometimes about every every minute I didn't have with him when I could be there so I do think I do think mothers and fathers grieve differently um I didn't um I didn't go to those uh, uh, I went once or twice with Elizabeth um we went with our daughter she was 15 when when Mac died mm -hmm. and um she was um th that particular group didn't quite fit for her but there was this wonderful senior in college who'd been our babysitter who just started coming over once a week, would often spend the night, um, and is now very much Izzy's big sister, but helped her through that time uh, in a way that neither of us could. And there was a bit of a gap. I mean, a lot of the children in the, that group were much younger than Izzy, so she was sort of in between. And talk about finding grace and receiving God's grace in, in those moments Ashley was very much a part of that. Um, but, but for me, you know, uh, Elizabeth taught me to journal, um, but I really 
um, it was only later that I developed that habit. At the time, it was very much articulating my thoughts and my wrestling through my blog, my website, where a lot of people would interact with it. Um, and so reflecting on the theological challenges and things, not so much because I had doubts, but more because I heard all sorts of people saying what they thought were really encouraging things to me, but which frankly I felt were, you know, I, I received them as the, as the grace they were intended, the love that they were intended, but I also wanted to just help shape that a little bit differently. And, and they became my conversation partner, if you will. But I will say one really important aspect. Elizabeth and I had developed the habit before Mac passed away of walking every night a two mile loop. Mm -hmm. That became vital for us to have our time together, um, giving Izzy some peace, our daughter some peace for her, and the two of us could just cry together and go through things together. That aspect uh, of grieving together was really, really important. And I'm also thinking, Christian, that not only were you grieving and talking, but you were moving your body and moving some yeah. of the trauma through your body. So it was yeah. like you were dealing with your body, your emotion, and your cognitive, all, all of it together, which is powerful. It helps. And I, I think, um, you know, at the uh, some of the conferences, they have the yoga and things. And I, I actually was introduced to, went to one of the sessions, the grief yoga, which I have continued with yoga. It's not called grief yoga, but I do find it's, um, it really is a whole, right? The spiritual, the physical, the emotional, um, it's, um, it really does take your whole self. I always say, you know, Death is an assault, a psychological, emotional, and physical assault to your system. Oh, yeah. And so mm -hmm. what you're doing is so helpful and healing. You know, there are a number of, of uh, really valuable elements, as I know you all share, uh, from different traditions. And Heidi, you talked about the physicality, which is true in depression and anxiety. Now, for example, in, in, in this time of COVID, it's really important that we still get those moments of exercise to the body chemistry going and, and, and everything else. Um, but in Judaism, for example, um, there are um, various traditions. And, and of course, Judaism is very broad, so not everybody shares the same traditions. But um, for example, um, just something simple that the, the anniversary of the death of someone uh, is, uses a Yiddish term, which is basically um, uh, German, yard site. Now, it literally just means anniversary, but within a Jewish community, you talk about someone's yard site. And there's something about having a single term, whereas, you know, we'll say that New Year's Eve is the anniversary of our son's death, you know, but, but to have that and then to mark it, right, that, that it's, it is something that to find, joy is not quite the right word, but to find the opportunity to celebrate. Just yesterday, I received an email from a member of our uh, church uh, nearby who had given a copy of the book to two friends who had lost their spouses, each of them independently. And uh, she forwarded me an email from one woman who'd lost her husband in the decades, and it was going to be uh, his birthday, or it was his birthday this past week. So she and a friend went out to dinner, and they talked about him and his life and all the great things he did, and they celebrated his birthday. Um, you know, those some of those elements I think we've lost in in a non-liturgical society, regardless of your religious context, as if it's sort of like, you know, that's past, now we move forward. Mm. You know, liturgy is about celebrating cycles of time and life. I love the idea of celebrating their lives. Mm -hmm. I, I like the idea of celebrating when they left this life too, mm -hmm. rather than having that, my horrible day, mm -hmm. you know, as things go on, celebrate the memory. Well, mom, and I think when you do it in a religious context, you feel less guilty because you're like, okay, I'm doing this because my religion also believes in it, you know, and this is what we're supposed to be doing. I mean, because there's some guilt sometimes people say about the celebration piece. One of the most interesting things, and I, I haven't actually been able to get to the writing of it yet, right? I've started and stopped so many times is the fact that Mac died on New Year's Eve, which is um, uh, for me as a list maker, uh, is the irony of the whole, I still haven't really been able to get around it, but you know, 
earlier in that day, in my journal that day, I had made a list, you know, Mac was not well and we were taking him to the hospital. We had no idea, of course, that he was dying later that day. Wow. And so, um, you know, we he was sick and we were taking him to the pediatrician, but uh, I often look at that journal and just think and about, you know, the that kind of mystery of life, right? Of course, we love him, we celebrate him and miss him. And he died later on the day that I was making a list for myself for the next year, right? Yeah. And um, I, I've never quite been able to kind of reconcile that for myself, but I think about it, you know? Yeah. Well, I, think, I think, honey, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's an important reminder, actually, mm -hmm. that while on the one hand, for example, in the Gospels um, and elsewhere, you have worry, uh, worry about mm -hmm. today only for tomorrow has enough troubles <laughs> to come kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But we can't, we can't live solely in the present either. The reality is, you know, we're all going to die. Uh, planes will crash. Cars will crash. I mean, there are all sorts of things that will happen. And if we spend our entire life dwelling on those, we'll be crippled, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I share that um, I grew up uh, learning very early on that my mom had uh, um, a, lupus called, uh, a disease called lupus, systemic lupus erythematosus. And I was told when I was very young that she might die in a day. Now she's just celebrated what I think it's her 83rd birthday. Wow. So she's still around. But I grew up with this sort of awareness and it's been something I've had to be very mindful about in terms of not being overwhelmed by the potential. I mean, one of the first thoughts when our daughter was born, well, when my, Elizabeth was in labor, was I could lose them both. Mm -hmm. you know and then when Izzy's there I'm like okay here's this beautiful wonderful thing what if something happens to her mm -hmm. well things will happen well I've got to ask you to something you have I'm just so impressed I mean you're in different places you have such a loving relationship I mean it just comes over and I want to tell you there are many people who are listening to this and watching it that are, have been told that they will divorce that they're at risk <laughs> Your Elizabeth has citations <laughs> for you. Uh, yeah, and, and you know, uh, I always, my husband and I have been married for many years and, you know, we have something huge in common We've and our whole family, we've lost the same thing. And it, it, it's, uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty amazing to have this depth. I was so mystified and uh, amazed about, it's a little bit like being at your bridal shower when people whisper to you, you know, the divorce rate is 50 percent right and here we were at um you know at events the and things for mac just just within days that he had died and of course the community was wonderful but people would pull you aside and say you know they say 50 percent of divorce uh, marriages will end in divorce after the death of a child well, I had three or four different people say that to me. So I started looking it up. I was like, what, is that true? So I actually found, I think it was actually on Open to Hope. It was um, uh, an article by Sandy Fox actually. And she wrote a book called Creating a New Normal After the Death of a Child. And because of that, in 2006, the Compassionate Friends actually did a survey of surviving parents of children who had died and found that it was actually more like 16 percent. Right. And um, and that actually a majority of them said uh, there were problems in the marriage before the child died and or it was one or the other of the spouse's fault. That seemed to be to you know variance in the factor but that for the most part like you said gloria the um no one can uh talk with mac and joy and miss him more than christian and his sister izzy you know and i think there's, you know and we share that you know we, we do mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. part of we've been mm -hmm. reflecting on this as uh, mm -hmm. you know as, as we are going through our middle age, many of our friends, their marriages for other reasons are winding down and things. And part of what we've been talking about recently, Elizabeth and I both, is 
there there seems to be so little conversation and i even do some premarital counseling and you know in my other hat and even in many <laughs> of those texts there's not a whole lot of discussion about the fact that your lives as as a as a couple are going to change you're going to change things will happen along the way and the point is not that you're marrying this 23 year old exactly how she or he is and they're going to stay that way but you're marrying a human being you're entering into a relationship with them and you're both going to change and grow in sickness and in health rich or poor all those dynamics will be there and there's a weird kind of assumption nobody says it but it's back there somewhere that um that nothing's going to change and so when things do change instead of you know girding your loins and saying all right we got to do some hard work together you know and the other aspect specifically on grief that um i learned very young watching after my grandfather died people grieve in such different ways mm -hmm. and each of us had to give the other and our daughter and our parents mm -hmm. and uh max friends we had to give everybody space to grieve their own way mm -hmm. and what i find in families does tend to drive a wedge is when you know the 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 mother loses her husband and is upset that her daughter isn't grieving the way she thinks her daughter should grieve or her son isn't grieving the way she thinks and mm -hmm. and you know it's just because there's so many emotions already mm -hmm. instead of just saying you you do what you need to do i'm over here I need this time to grieve. Well, let's talk quickly about your latest book, because I know you're an expert in uh, theology and you've written a number of books. So Beautiful and Terrible Things, which is kind of amazing name, A Christian Struggle with Suffering, Grief, and Hope. Tell us, give us a quick rundown on your book and what you're hoping this will do for people. So the title, Beautiful and Terrible Things, comes from a quote by Frederick Buechner. It's, Here's the world. Beautiful and terrible things will happen. Don't be afraid. I will be with you. And so what I try to sketch out in this book is first starting, as I did that night, with lament. That it is okay. It's a, it is necessary to lament, to cry out, to complain to God. God is big enough that he can take your anger and your frustration but if you actually look at the structure of a biblical lament, it starts by saying, God, what on earth? Where are you? How that, could you possibly allow this to happen? And then it moves into reflection of all the great and wonderful things God has done in our lives as we've moved along. And then the assertion, God, I need you to do that now, right here. I need you here. And then it always closes with praise, and I will praise you. When you've lost your child, if somebody comes and says, God took your child for a reason, that is not consoling nor comforting. And as a scholar, I also don't think it's borne out by the biblical witness. Let's look at what the Bible really says and realize that the Bible says you can be angry at God, you need to express your grief, and even still, while there are terrible things, there are beautiful things too, and God's commitment is, I will be with you. Hey, thank you too for being on the show. You're a, a lovely couple and uh, I love your story and I love the way you help yourself and other people. I know you must help thousands of people. <laughs> Heidi and I want to thank you all for joining us today. And we always want to remind you that if you've lost hope, please lean on ours until you find your own and God bless. I'm Dr. Heidi Horsley. You have been listening to Open to Hope, the podcast. You can follow Open to Hope on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. To learn more, visit us at opentohope.com and go to Apple Podcasts to subscribe. I'm Dr. Gloria Horsley. Join us again next week for another Open to Hope conversation, where we invite you to lean on our hope until you find your own.